In this video, Dr. Hawks explains the science behind tracing genetic and literal ancestry to allow for multiple ways of looking at the placement of Adam and Eve. Before we listen to his in-depth explanation, let's start with some basics. To understand genetics a little better, let's look at a family tree. So let's assume that this individual right here is you. These are your parents and these are your grandparents. As a human, you carry 46 chromosomes, but in actuality, it's two sets of 23. 23 of them came from your dad, and 23 of them came from your mom. Let's look at just one pair of those chromosomes. Let's say it's chromosome number one. Let's go way back to your grandparents. So you might have grandpa here who carries a number one chromosome from his mother and a number one chromosome from his father, and we're gonna label them as A and B, just to indicate the different genes that might be on each chromosome. They're slightly different, right? So blue eyes versus green eyes, or attached earlobes versus unattached earlobes. And then if you look at grandma, she's carrying a, her own unique set that came from her parents. So we're like labeling those C and D. So your father is a unique combination he has two chromosomes, one of which he inherited from his dad and one of which he inherited from his mom. So looking at his dad, let's say he got this chromosome here from dad, and so we're gonna label that one as A. And then from mom, let's say that he got the D chromosome. So he's an AD. Now let's look at your maternal grandparents. Your maternal grandparents, grandpa, he has two chromosomes, we're labeling them E and F, and she has two chromosomes, and we're labeling them G and H. And so your, your mother inherited two chromosomes, and let's say that she got the E from her dad, and she got the G from her mom, so we'll label that now. So she got an E, and she got a G. And so then let's look at you. If you get only one set, so should you either get the A or the D, let's give you the A. So you got A from your dad, and then we can look at mom, and let's give you the G from your mom. And so you are A, G. Now let's go ahead and look back at your paternal grandmother. Do you have any of the genes from your paternal grandmother? And if you look, she's a CD, so you don't have any of her genes. And likewise, if you look at your maternal grandfather, he's an EF, and you don't carry any of those. So you could say that these two individuals are your direct ancestors, but genetically, they're not your ancestors at all, just because over this short amount of time, we're talking three generations, you've lost that DNA because of the random assorting of chromosomes when we make egg and sperm that, that we give to our offspring. Now there are two things to keep in mind that might slow this down, the losing of genetic material from a direct ancestor. Number one is that we have not just this one set of chromosomes, we have 23 sets of chromosomes. So we end up inheriting more of the DNA, so this might stretch back to 10 generations. And the other thing that happens is our chromosomes, the pairs tend to swap information with each other, so this A chromosome that you got from your father, who he got from his father, may actually contain some of the B chromosome and some of the D chromosome. So we get a little more admixture. But the consequences are still the same. You can lose almost all of the genetics of a given direct ancestor who is your ancestor within just a few short generations. So that should help us as we listen to Dr. John Hawks explain this. Let's listen to how Dr. Hawks explains this. So Adam and Eve. This is, a, this is such a great concept, right? Because it's so naturally genealogical. We as humans are all connected in genealogy. And that genealogical connection is vastly more powerful than our genetics, right? And why do I say that? You share half your DNA with your mother and half with your biological mother and half with your biological father. And a fourth on average, which is through your grandparents, and an eighth with your, with your great grandparents. And as you go further back, this gets less and less. And eventually, you have relatives, ancestors, ancestors, grandparents that you don't have any DNA from. Your genetic relationship with your ancestors goes away within 
seven to 10 generations, you start to get ancestors that you have no DNA from. And the number of ancestors potentially that you have, right, is doubling every time, right? Two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, eight great grandparents, 16 great greats, right? Doubles every time. You go back 10 generations and you have 1,024 lines. Now, many of us come from communities where 10 generations back, you know, you're talking about 300 years ago. No, there were cousins that were getting married and are in my family tree. If not first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, I don't have 1,024 ancestors. I have 920, right? Because they start to intertwine. Well, believe me, as you go back further, they all intertwine, right? As you go back to 20 generations, you've got a million genealogical lines, but I guarantee you they're going back to, you know, maybe tens of thousands of people for most of us. They've become tightly intertwined. By the time you go back 30 generations, a billion lines, there weren't a billion people in the world then. Right, so everybody's lines are intertwined at that point. The number of genes or gene sequence parts that you have from any of your ancestors at that time is on average zero. You don't have genetics for most of your ancestors 30 generations ago. But you have genealogy. Adam and Eve is the ultimate genealogical concept. Right? Because it says, it recognizes, I can trace my family back, and it goes back, and there's more and more and more lines, but I know that actually there's cousins, and I know that those lines, I can connect them. Those of us who historically have come from small communities, as most people did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, they knew the cousins that were on their lines of ancestry, and they knew that genealogy was not just a branching outwards pattern, it also branched in. And once you know that it's branching in, then you know that there's convergence. That you come to a point where there was an ancestor that all of us share. That point, mathematically, we know today was super recent. Within probably 5,000 years ago, every human on Earth has somebody that all of us could potentially trace as a genealogical ancestor if we knew our genealogies, right? That's not so long ago. And believe me, I'm a skeptic about this. I look at this and I'm like, wait a minute. What about parts of the world that were super isolated from other parts at that time, right? What about Tasmania, where people, after the last, glass, the last glaciation, indigenous Australians on Tasmania were separated from the mainland Australia, and for 10,000 years, there may have been no crossing of individuals between those, right? How is it possible that? The answer is, well, over the last 200 years, humans have spread throughout the world and intermarried, and actually every living person with indigenous Tasmanian ancestry also has European ancestry. There is nowhere that, that that is that isolated today and has not been for two, three hundred years. So there's this convergence that's happened and also this deep genealogical convergence. When did our last genealogical ancestor live? Probably less than 5,000 years ago. There's a time not much longer before that when every ancestor that any of us have is part of the same set of ancestors, where none of us have any different ancestors. And that time is probably within the last 20 to 30,000 years. Wow, you know, okay. I'm looking at 1,000 generations ago. We all have the same ancestors. Nobody has any different ancestors. We have different fractions of DNA from different groups of them because for some of us, more of our genealogical lines go back to the European ancestors and more, so others more go back to the African ancestors and so on. But, wow, the genealogies have converged. We have identical ancestors 
even if we have different ge genetic ancestry. Where is Adam in this? Where is Eve in this? One way of looking at it is to say that it's the genealogical ancestor that we all share. That person is special even if we can't today identify them, even if their name has been lost. Another way of looking at it is, um, you know, these are members of a community when we all had the same ancestors. Another way of looking at it is, you know, actually, these are people that lived at a time when our ancestral population may have been uniquely small and have given rise to a common genetic ancestor. The mitochondrial Eve concept is tied to that. We, our female line, traces back through the mitochondrial inheritance, and it traces back to a woman who lived sometime around 200,000 years ago. That's way before we all have the same ancestors, right? From 200,000 years ago to maybe 20,000 years ago, those are not different ancestors groups we're talking about. The ancestors are the same, but the genes are tracing their way back through those ancestors until they trace back to one unique woman, mitochondrial Eve. My, y chromosome Adam exists as well. The Y chromosomes all trace back to a common man. That man lived more than 350,000 years ago. So Adam, in that sense, the Y chromosome Adam, lived maybe 150,000 years before Eve, the mitochondrial Eve. And that's uniquely our female and male inheritance through genealogy. But then you can look more broadly, right? What if we actually look earlier? What if we look at the first humans that were different from other groups, Neanderthals that might have lived at the same time? Or the ancestors that we share with the Neanderthals, right? Neanderthals are humans. Maybe we need an Adam that includes the ancestry of the Neanderthals. Then we're looking at people who lived more than 700,000 years ago. At every stage, we're tying to a different kind of ancestor, but at every stage, those ancestors are inclusive. The Y chromosome common ancestor that we share today with Neanderthals, all Neanderthals, lived more than 800,000 years ago. We could identify that person as an Adam. That person is an ancestor of everybody today under every other one that I've talked about so far, right? He's a common ancestor of everybody. He's, a, he's shared by everybody. There's no difference between us and whether we have him as an ancestor, right? And this is true of points in between. When it comes down to it, and when I talk about shared history and, and why these things actually tie to genealogy, it's because you can't get very far from genealogy. We don't have different genealogies from each other that are older than probably 20,000 years old. That's pretty powerful because all of the human history that's unfolded has unfolded upon a basis that we share totally before that. The takeaway is that we can have direct ancestors such as Adam and Eve without sharing DNA with them. And from a scientific perspective, we could reasonably place Adam and Eve at several different time points, depending on how you look at it.